Yes? All right. It took a long night of work, so I hope you guys appreciate it. Uh, this is definitely a tough presentation to give second day after lunch, so I'll try to keep it as entertaining as I can, uh, and then we'll, we'll try to keep it uh, to the point. Um, it's uh, definitely a pleasure to be back here for the second year and see that uh, a lot of the tone of the conversation in the last 12 months really uh, has changed quite a bit uh, in how to provide and, and address the Wi-Fi uh, connectivity problem on trains. Um, a lot has been said in the past few days about trackside solutions and how they fit and they don't fit in some applications. I guess my goal here is to give you a more in-depth view of what trackside connectivity can really do for onboard Wi-Fi and, and show you also some real numbers of you know, what we've been able to deliver uh, in some of the systems uh, we have done. Uh, I'll try to fill all that in about half an hour uh, and then uh, if, you get, if you guys have any questions I'll leave a, a few minutes after the presentation uh, so uh, we can discuss more. All right, very briefly about us uh, for the uh, one of you that are not that familiar with Fluid Mesh, we've been around for about 10 years. We're an MIT spin-off based out of Chicago. Uh, we do have, we have uh, quite a few offices around the world. Uh, we landed our R&D center, so all the, the smarts are actually based out of Italy. Uh, we recently opened a new office in New York City, so we do have quite an international uh, footprint. Let me set the expectation here. I want to set the stage, and this has come up in the last two days. Uh, the reason, I guess, why we're here for these two days is because there is an expectation in our, your customer base. Uh, your passengers want to have connectivity everywhere, always and fast. And the problem is we are currently having a hard time delivering this expectation to the majority of the customers. I've heard a lot of interesting ideas on how to address or somewhat limit uh, the disappointment, but we feel that some of the new technologies out there, including Trackside, are offering quite a bit of an improvement that can help uh, address this challenge. So, there is a technology gap, really, that needs to be solved. Um, there are lots of technologies out there that can be used for um, delivering Wi-Fi on board. Uh, we see a lot of the GPRS, UMTS, 3G, 4G, 4G LTE, all the different flavors. Uh, great technologies for some applications. Uh, the good thing is that they can handle up to uh, 300 kilometers an hour, which is uh, good. The bad thing is that you're going to have a bit of a hard time passing on average 10 megabits per second. It's going to be hard to manage, it's going to be hard to control, really you're not going to have any control on it. And that for a lot of what we're trying to solve today is a bit of a challenge. Then you have other technologies, the Wi-Max, the H2, the 11 and so forth, the Wi-Fi based uh, products which are capable of giving you 100 megs, but as soon as you start roaming past about 10 kilometers an hour. Uh, they're going to give you uh, an issue because they're not able to run. In order to address the onboard Wi-Fi solution, we need something that gives 100 megabits per second all the way to 300 kilometers an hour. I feel that is really the beginning of the conversation. Um, a lot of, again, what was discussed, I think proves our theory and, and I'm glad that many of you agree that the requirements for bandwidth has gone up and will keep going up and we feel as fluid much that cellular technology is indeed you know, a good technology to use, but it will never be able to keep up with what uh, the demand is at the moment. This is exactly the problem that we're solving today using Fluidity. So, uh, Fluidity is our proprietary train to ground communication system that is able to provide up to 100 megabits per second all the way to 350 kilometers an hour. Um, it's based by, it's really composed by three pieces. I'll try to break it down for you. Uh, there is an onboard piece, usually we mount one or two radios per train. Uh, there is a trackside piece that you guys are all, I think, by now fairly familiar with. You gotta deploy a trackside infrastructure, uh, deploying radios anywhere between one to about three miles, um, depending on the set. And then you have a backbone piece, uh, as uh, was already discussed by some of you. Clearly all these towers, which are the trackside infrastructure, need to have fiber backbone or a wireless backbone that goes back to the head. Now, uh, we have clearly different applications that can run on this infrastructure. 
We are getting a lot of requests for onboard security camera streaming, being able to offload the video that you guys have recorded on board uh, in a more effective way, as well as monitoring that video line, regardless of where your train or metro system is. We have clearly a lot of requests about onboard Wi-Fi for the limiting factors that cellular and satellite are currently having. But also the technology can be used for video signal signaling and CVTC. Uh, I'll show some of the CVTC results we've been uh, running. Most of the time, these two are called non vital This is vital way. On most of the systems, these two are separate. Actually, they feel on two different networks. There are some more uh, forward-thinking customers that are integrating everything into the same platform. But for what we've seen out there, they usually run on separate networks. So, from a technology standpoint, this is what we use, fairly basic. Um, it's a 2x2 MIMO radio that runs a very innovative MPLS-based protocol that we have developed called Prodigy 2.0. The system can run on any frequency really from 2.4 to 6.0 gig. Um, the innovation is really in the protocol that we have developed more than in, in the wireless radio, if you want, that, that we're using. Uh, we haven't really figured out a way to, to change the physics of wireless transmission yet, but we're working on it. Um, modulation speed up to 300 megabits per second. We're delivering a solid throughput up to uh, 100 megs. Latency per up on 3 per second, and then you have your VLAN and AES encryption. Uh, one of the key things is that some of the challenges that, I guess, some of the Wi-Fi and wireless manufacturer have is there is a lot of very tight um, standards in railroad and clearly developing a product for that for those standards uh, does require quite a bit of commitment you know we have committed to this space about three years ago we have now um, released uh, radios that actually satisfy all the uh, different standards for rail so we feel that you know we're fairly well positioned to, to really offer a real solution to you guys more than just you know an idea of a bunch of access points uh, roaming around but the real innovation is how we handle the handoff. So if you want to really do 100 megabits per second all the way to 350 kilometers an hour or 220 miles an hour for the one of you that live on the other side of the ocean, um, you need to be able to handle the handoff between access point in a seamless way. And uh, we actually have patented a new technology that allows us to cut back on the handoff time drastically thanks to our MPLS engine. So, uh, we brought it down from 700 milliseconds, which is the age to the level baseline, to actually 3 milliseconds. Uh, at this point, uh, as far as we know, we're the only one that has a handoff in, in single digit range. Why do you need it? Because that's going to affect your throughput and that's going to affect your reliability when you try to do train to ground communication. So, uh, just to recap here on some of the applications uh, onboard security cameras, high speed Wi Fi for passengers. Uh, voice over IP for public announcement and emergency phones, streaming uh, content, digital signage, CBTC, as well as onboard small cell. Uh, we're getting more and more requests for backhauling small cells, particularly for those of you that have a lot of underground structures. The good thing about trackside networks is that you can use them above ground, you can use them below ground. Uh, some of the requirements are different, but we're still delivering the same performance all over uh, the track, so that is clearly on that. Um, the other advantage is that it's really an infrastructure that you have and you can reuse for a lot of different applications. You know, uh, we feel that the approach to connectivity on a train is somewhat changing. We're kind of following the IT space where you have one main infrastructure for data and then you're actually channeling all your data through it uh, compared to what you know, the old approach was that you had a signaling system, you had a CCTV system, you had a Wi-Fi system and so forth. So, this may evolve even more, um, but really as far as we're concerned, it's really an IP network that delivers 100 max all the way to 350 kilometers an hour. You can do whatever you want with it once you have them work. So a few different, uh, few more details, I guess, on why this is different uh, than 3G uh, cellular or satellite. And, uh, you know, I agree very much with some of the statements that were done earlier, saying that in reality, when you're trying to cover a country, it's going to be a combination of technologies. You know, it's going to be some track side, it's going to be some cellular, maybe some satellite. Uh, you know, at this point, given the cost and, and how technology is developing, uh, it is kind of hard to pretend to do all the track all together uh, using track side technology. Uh, but here are some uh, differences just for you guys to keep in mind. 
So if we're looking at uh, throughput, uh, cellular and satellite do have a challenge that do not have, for most cases, a uh, symmetry in upload and download speed. If you're doing Wi-Fi, uh, that usually it's kind of okay. If you're trying to offload video from your vehicles, you're going to need a lot of upload, which usually is a very scarce resource. Uh, the advantage of using a fluidity system is that the throughput is completely symmetric and you have control on it. When we talk about available bandwidth, cellular, you know, we've seen that really on average you're running between 1 and 10 megs uh, per second. Uh, satellite is 10 to 20 for what we've seen. We've been able to push up to 100 megabits per second, uh, and this is what we can do today. Uh, I'm really trying to give you a realistic view of what TrackSight can do today. Uh, we can talk all day long about what we're going to do in three to five years, but given that this technology is already fairly innovative, I thought I would keep it real and, and show you what we do. Um, the business model is very interesting, and this is one of my favorite, I guess, uh, topics here. The big difference is that this is a capex technology. You buy it, you own it, you use it um, for as long as you want to. Uh, you decide where you're offering coverage, you decide how much throughput you're offering, you decide who has access to it. Very different than cellular, where you're going to go to your carrier and say, hey, I need this. They're going to say, great, here's what you're going to pay. They're not going to confirm any performance, they're not going to confirm any coverage, and um, they're really not going to add a tower for you in case you have an area where there is no coverage. Um, Satellite behaves in a bit of a similar way where you're still paying a monthly fee. Um, there is a reliable uptime involved, you know, and this is really a massive challenge. With TrackSide, you can control your throughput. You know what you have, you know where you have. Uh, it's not the same thing for cellular and satellite. And then the last thing is clearly the roaming part, uh, particularly with uh, satellite, but also cellular. It's very hard to have seamless roaming. I mean, if you're roaming from one tower to the next, most likely you're going to drop data. So let's, uh, now I, this is kind of the famous slide where everyone usually uh, asks me a thousand questions. How much does it cost? So uh, a lot of you have very unique numbers in mind and think that this is the most expensive thing out there. Uh, I want to say start by saying that every system we've done or designed is actually different. Uh, one of the challenges of clearly installing this is that it does require knowledge about your environment, your track, your trains, and your morphology of the whole you know, infrastructure, uh, it's very, it would be very hard for me to keep tell you, hey, just you know, multiply the number of miles you have by this number. But ballpark, this is the cost that we've seen. As far as you know, fluid mesh, fluidity hardware is concerned, you're running anywhere between five to about $15,000 per mile. Um, and it's a bit of a wide range depending on you know, the towers, the line of sight that you have, if you're underground or above ground, and so forth. This does not include any labor, uh, and this does assume that you have fiber to the poles. Okay? Uh, the spacing between the poles, just to make sure we're clear, uh, we are doing anywhere between one to about three months. Uh, a very important piece here that makes this technology more affordable is to be able to reuse existing infrastructure. A lot of the systems that um, we have been delivering are actually uh, designed with an effort to reuse as much track set infrastructure as possible. GSMR towers are a great way to actually add radios in the field. You already have GSMR towers out there. You have the tower, you have power, and you have fiber into all of those. And ballpark, they're about four to five kilometers apart, which makes them a very good starting point for your track site infrastructure. In the US, we have PTC, similar idea, there's a bunch of towers that already have been deployed along the track. You have the tower, you have power, and you have fiber to most of those. So you already have done a lot of the hard work. Uh, there is another thing to keep in mind. The system does not actually require towers. So many other times we use other infrastructure you guys have out there to deploy the radius. The radius is fairly small. So don't think that you need to deploy a tower or otherwise the system is not going to work. There are a lot of systems that we're deploying that we're using bridges, we're using communication cabinets, we're even using you know, small poles uh, attached to the side of the right of way to clearly bring the cost down. Good news is it's something that is customized for your needs, for your right of way, for where you need coverage. You don't have to start with a minimum amount of coverage, you don't have to cover the whole thing altogether. 